The Villa Stein de Moncy, usually called simply by its location, Garch, is a very different kind of translation of the domino system into a suburban house. And here we can see all the features of domino, the column grid and its supporting horizontal slabs, its relationship to the earth, the separation of the structural columns from the interior walls that allows a free arrangement of the plan, the implication now fulfilled of a non-load-bearing wall in front of the slab on the long side, and the fact that it's a non-load-bearing wall being indexed by windows that go across the entire width of the facade, what Le Corbusier would call ribbon windows or elongated windows. And then there's even a balcony that projects in front of the wall plane that in a way further develops or fulfills this implication of pulling the columns back from that slightly cantilevered slab that in front of that slab, one is free to put a kind of wrapper or a facade of different types. We will see again this idea of an itinerary of movement and stasis, of frontality and rotation. This time, however, that itinerary begins well beyond the house at the entrance to the entire site that is marked by a little concierge building with a kind of a skeletal canopy or skeletal gate through which you first enter and where we're initially fixed by the frontality of this rectangular facade in the distance, but we're fixed just off center so that already the idea of frontality and an implied need for rotation is introduced. From that vantage, we can start to perceive, e even if it's uh, unconsciously, the what Le Corbusier called regulating lines of the facades. For example, there are diagonals that go from the top corner to the opposite bottom corner, and then other lines that are developed off that diagonal that are either parallel or perpendicular to that diagonal. And these give the facade a sensation of a very strict order, but at the same time, it allows enormous variations of openings and punctures and balconies in the wall. The wall envelope defines that all-important volumetric quality that Le Corbusier sees as defining objet type. The column grid at Garsh is not the square column grid of the domino plan. It's rather a kind of geometric grid that has a rhythm of base sizes, A, B, A, B, A, or the proportion of the base is two to one, two to one, and two. The English historian and critic Colin Rowe compared this patterned uh, geometric grid with Palladio's Villa Malcontenta that we saw earlier in this course. Within that column grid, and free of the, of the structuring uh, function of that column grid, are uh, these curvilinear stairwells and rooms with curved partition that are very, very similar to the objet type of purist paintings. And many critics have actually seen the villa as something like a three-dimensional purist painting. Le Corbusier himself saw these uh, curved uh, shapes inside the column grid as what he called compressed organs of the house. And indeed, often the, uh, the curves will indicate spaces of intense bodily performance, for example, like a stairwell. Coming back to the front facade, the main entrance to the villa is fitted with a big cantilevered awning. Located symmetrically to the main entrance is another smaller service entrance, but above the service entrance is placed a balcony. So there's a kind of symmetry, or better, there's a kind of balance to the two entries around the center of the facade, but it's not an exact repetition, it's not an exact symmetry. The two large elongated windows register the fact that it is a non-load-bearing wall and the balcony that punctures through the surface at the very top, again, starts a kind of plasticity. It starts a kind of layering of the wall that will be carried out on the interior of the house. 
The first floor accommodates a large entry hall as well as a garage and various service spaces. When we enter the entry hall, we come into contact then with the freestanding columns or what Le Corbusier called the freestanding T. And here, because the columns are freestanding apart from the wall, they operate almost like a little framing device that creates a moment of stasis after the long movement through the site and through the front door into the entry. At that moment of stasis, we confront a curved wall symmetrically placed within that frame, as well as a diagonal wall just to the left. And the kind of spatial forces of the curved wall and the diagonal wall almost compel us to turn to the right to find the main stair that will take us up to the primary second floor. The second floor has the main living spaces, the dining room and the kitchen. Given the elongated windows, we might expect that the second floor would comprise a very large living space that would run parallel to the front wall or parallel to the garden wall. In fact, Le Corbusier has divided it up in exactly the opposite way. The vertical surfaces that divide the space are perpendicular to the two long outside walls. The curvilinear wall of the dining room at once makes an enclosing sort of space for the dining room that has a view out the back to the garden, but the curve also sets up an axis which defines the center of the living room on the opposite side. At the front of the living room is a gallery from which we can move out onto a sheltered terrace, which can be seen from the living room and the dining room, but not accessed. Once again, we have now a more complicated version of rotation and frontality. The, the whole uh, kind of weight or, or, or energy of the main floor plan seems to be on the periphery. There seems to be a kind of uh, energetic swirling of space around that central uh, living room. Uh, and, and that swirling of space, which creates now a, a rotation almost virtual rotation that parallels our bodily rotation through the spaces. Uh, against that are these vertical surfaces, often given a kind of figuration because of a certain kind of curve or a certain kind of opening that creates moments of stasis within that peripheral swirl. The third floor accommodates the bedrooms. And then finally, on the top floor, there's an enormous terrace with a sauna. And here we can really get the sense of what Luc Rossier meant when he talked about compressed organs. The sauna is a very intense bodily space. It's where the hot, wet air and what for Corbusier was an important hygienic function of the sauna would be performed. And he gives the sauna a little lozenge shape, again, like a little organ placed on top of the roof terrace, which itself then would provide dry air and sunlight again for a hygienic function. The top terrace has often reminded commentators of not just the, the hygienic health uh, functions that Corbusier wanted to be performed there, but also of an ocean liner, the sort of deck of an ocean liner, where beyond the function of sort of a healthy space that's provided, it was also an industrial space, a new kind of space, on top of, of an ocean liner, which along with automobiles and airplanes were the objet type that Corbusier thought represented modern industry and modern spirit.